Okay, okay. May the Lord lead us as we study. Uh, now, last time we studied, we had um, we were covering the part two of the third world. I pray that as we study, uh, you may comprehend what I'm sharing. So may God give us his spirit. Amen. The third war, we know how it's well introduced in part in uh, chapter 11 of Revelation. And here we get Islam uh, coming to the picture. So I'd like to recap, to do a simple recap for what we have already uh, covered. Now, this is where we ended. And uh, we were looking at this group called the Taliban. We realized that this group, the Taliban, uh, it is its history comes all the way from Saudi Arabia. I think you can see this man who was leading the group called the Al Qaeda, called Osama bin Laden. We realized that he was protected by the Taliban. And we realized that this man, Osama bin Laden, he's himself, you can see here, a Saudi Arabian militant. Himself is a Saudi Arabian, you see. And, that, and, and why is this important? Is because we read somewhere in Jeremiah that from Saudi Arabia, that's where the asses come from. Or where uh, what we realized as the donkeys or the horses come from. So we realized that... This group they called the Taliban in Afghanistan. Afghanistan be, uh, was uh, basically fought and conquered by the, 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 the Arabs and also the Turks. So those groups make up the people that are in Afghanistan. And because of that, we realized that that means essentially this is Islam in Afghanistan that is doing this uh, role that we can see in Bible prophecy. So these are Arabs. So the, the Taliban, they have uh, the history of Arabs, their, their origins. Okay. And uh, we realized that from 2001, there was a restraint for a limitation to these Taliban. Why? Because after they had struck the Twin Towers in New York, the army was of USA was sent uh, to Afghanistan to fight this group called the Taliban and of course the Al Qaeda. So the Al Qaeda and the Taliban were friends, and in that case, because the Taliban were the outstanding militants, USA was fighting them until we realized that last year, in fact, on the same date, the same date on which the Twin Towers were put down on the same date, Biden called these people to come back away from Afghanistan, the, the, the American army. So they withdrew from Afghanistan. Question is, did they withdraw because they had now conquered the Taliban? The answer is no. It is because the Taliban had become powerful, and so they had to withdraw shamefully and uh, they didn't want their people to die there anymore. So the Taliban retook control of Afghanistan in 2021, two decades after being removed from power by a US-led military coalition. So we realized that even the promises they made uh, to, to, to America, they didn't fulfill them. You can read on this third, third paragraph. It says that within weeks, the Taliban were in control of all of Afghanistan, something they had not managed to do in their first stint in power between 1996 and 2001. Last time we realized that the Taliban came to power officially in 1996. But this time around, when they have come back to power, they have done more than they did in 1996. In 1996, they took control of the city called Kabul. But this time round, they have taken control of the whole of Afghanistan within weeks. What does that mean? It means that they are more powerful than the beginning. And also, the way we started, we realized 
that in the Second War, at the beginning, there were fightings uh, using spears and arrows, basically where the Muslims were Akas, most like, mostly they were Akas, they used to use the arrows. But at the, at, at, um, at, the, at the beginning, sorry, let me correct myself. In the time of the First War, they were fighting with the spears and these other ammunitions. But at the beginning of the Second War, after five, uh, the after four years, when this other sultan had died, who was allowing the the emperor in uh, the emperor of Greece to to sit in Constantinople had died, we realized that these people attacked with a more powerful attack. What did they do? They used a more sophisticated weapon. You see, they had they were they now used at that time the gunpowder was invented and so they used guns as that's what we also see on these charts prophetic charts we realized that in the first war they were using basically spears i think you can see that they were using spears and they were also using arrows and swords but in the second war they were using gunpowder this is what you're seeing he's shooting uh holding the gun but it's passing on the direction of the mouth of the horse. This is where John the, Bab, uh, John the Revelator says that he saw that out of the mouth of the horses, there came out smoke, brimstone, and uh, smoke and brimstone. So basically, this is what was making up the gunpowder. As they shoot, there comes out the smoke and the brimstone. So in time of John the Revelator, they didn't know about guns. And he described this as he could best describe it. He said that out of the mouth of these horses came out of, came out uh, smoke, fire, and brimstone. So now, when we see that at the beginning, uh, as we studied, we saw that history repeats itself in this case, specifically the prophecies, they repeat themselves. Now, let me try to illustrate this. When we saw the first war beginning in 1299, ending in 1449, this is the first war. And this is the second war where it begins in 1449 and it ends in 1840. This is the second war. Now, in our time, we have the third war. We realized last time that it began in 9-11, uh, which is basically 2001, 11th of September, and it ends in the seventh plague, the seventh plague. But it has also something to do with the general clause of probation, the whole world. Last time I gave you a homework, to go and study and see if the seventh, if this third war, third war, does end in the seventh plague. Why? If there are chances that this third war would be ending at the general clause of probation, basically. But also there are chances that it can be ending in the seventh plague. Why? In the seventh plague, we realize in this time of the plagues, there are fightings. And these fightings, this battle is not just spiritual battle only, as many try to bring it in place. No, there are also physical battles called this battle of Armageddon. It is spiritual and physical. The, the weapons being made up in the world today, they will also be used in this time period, I see. So Islam should be fighting as well amidst this time, but there's a possibility that its fighting essentially ends at the general clause of probation, when Michael stands up, and this is Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It can, has a possibility of ending at this place right here. Why am I saying that? Because it's not a must that wherever a trumpet begins is where the war begins. Neither is it a must that wherever the war begins is where the trumpet begins. When we look at 
this second war, the trumpet began in 1449, but it did not end in 1840. It ended in 1844. That's when the trumpet ended. But the war ended in 1840. Uh -huh. Now, we know that history repeats itself. These prophecies must repeat. When we look at the first, we join it with the second, it gives us the characteristics of the third war. What does that mean? It means that if this aspect was in this war, then there, there are possibilities that it could be in this war as well. When we look at the seventh trumpet, which is the, the third war, this is the second war, which is the sixth trumpet. This is the first war, which is the fifth trumpet. When you look at the seventh trumpet, it begins in 1888, uh, right here, in 1844, sorry. It begins here, the trumpet. But the war comes later on and begins in 2001. So there is that possibility that the war can end only here and then the trumpet ends here. But the possibility is that the trumpet will end both here and the war here. But we have it well concluded that the seventh war trumpet ends right here. What gives us that conclusion? It's because the verses have the same uh, characteristics. And the characteristic we see in the seventh plague is that there is great hail. And when you go to chapter 11 of Revelation, you realize that the seventh plague has hail and the seventh trumpet has hail. That means the seventh trumpet ends in the seventh plague, as simple as that. So now what I'm saying is this. In the second war, just at its beginning, it took four years to 1453. Here, they attacked, they besieged the city, Constantinople, and they killed very, very many Christians. So Islam at this point was allowed to kill, according to what we studied. And so from this time, we ask ourselves, what gave them this power or this ability to do great than they did in the first part? It's because of the type of ammunition that was used. So what do we expect also in this time period of this third war? We have to expect the same characteristics in the first and in the second. If here it was a weaker beginning and the end is strong, then we have to see the same here. We must combine them here. That's why from 1996, they seized Kabul only in Afghanistan. They had power, but at this point, this side, this time round, they are coming back with more power. And that is in 2021. 20, they have a more power than they had here. So we are seeing something here, repeating what happened here. So what do we expect out of this? What we saw is that what, what we saw is that what happened in 2021, this uh, Islam being loosened little by little, we realize that it has to accomplish the reason for its loosening. God has to accomplish a reason for loosening Islam. And so we expect Islam to attack in this time period sometime from now. So when it attacks, do we expect it to have a little blow than the beginning or a more blow? than the beginning. Of course, a more blow than the beginning. That's what I want to try to illustrate there in the times of repetition. Okay. So that's what happened just last year. And uh, we continued, and this is where we ended. And this is what I'd like us to try to give our mind. But we, before we give that mind, we will need to and ask ourselves a question and understand, does God use the heathen to fulfill his will? Because someone asked him or herself, do you mean that God uses the heathen? Now, when you read in different books of the Bible, God calls the heathen actually his servants. For example, when you read about Nebuchadnezzar, he calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. When you read about uh, Cyrus, he calls Cyrus his servant as well. You see? 
and he says he will, he will reward him. So it's interesting how God does his things. And when God uses a heathen, he wants all of them to be saved as well. So he brings them in a, meet with, in a meeting with his people such that they may have a chance to be saved. And if they fail to be saved, if they fail to be humbled, of course, they will be punished. So it's the same thing with Islam. God is uses this not because they are good, not because they are holy, but because it is his army, according to what is written. All right. Go with me to the book of Joel. Joel. Joel is just uh, is in the last books of the Old Testament. Joel is before the book Amos and after the book Hosea. We are opening Joel chapter 2. We are reading from verse 1. Kindly follow me step by step for you to basically understand this. We are reading from verse 1 and what do we read immediately from verse 1 says that Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land... Do what? Tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Mark the word, the day of the Lord. And another thing I'd like you to mark is that this is the blowing of the trumpet. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. And what are we studying? We are studying the seventh trumpet, which is called the third woe. And we are looking at the primary part of the seventh trumpet, which is the third woe this time. And we see that when this trumpet is blown and, 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 and the sound of an alarm in the holy mountain is given, what must happen next? It is that let all the inhabitants of the land do what? Tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. We will need to understand what is the day of the Lord as we go ahead. Go with me to verse 2. It says that a day of what? So it is continuing to talk about this day of the Lord. We will soon understand that this day of the Lord is not just one day. It is a period. And because of that, we will need also to conclude when does this day begin and when does it end. If we can have that, it will help us to unlock many things. So it continues concerning this day. What is this day? Read with me. It says that, a day of darkness, one, and of gloominess, a day of clouds, and of thick darkness. These terms are important to note, just as the other terms we, we noted. The terms, thunderings, lightnings, voices, light. Those terms were important, and we saw how they repeat in the whole of the book of Revelation, and we saw the message they bring ahead. So it's the same thing I like you and me to notice here. So a day of what? Darkness and of gloominess a day of clouds and thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and are strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So, this day is a morning. Did you read it? Did you see that? It says that as the morning spread upon the mountains, so this day is a morning. That is what it is showing here. And in that morning, as it spreads on the mountains, what is seen? What is seen is a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So we need to know these people. Who are these strong people? Let's continue. Verse 3 says, A fire devoureth before them, before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Ye and nothing shall escape them. So these people, when they go somewhere, they find the place as beautiful and green as the garden of Eden. But whatever they do while passing in that place, it remains as a wilderness, as a desert. You get the point. We need to know who are these people. 
And what is this type of operation? Verse 4. The appearance of them is as the appearance of what? Of horses. Now, this is where we try now uh, to begin to understand. This issue of horses, as we can see, this horse and this horse, these were very well concluded that the horse represents Islam in the Bible prophecy. And at the same time, represents uh, the, the, uh, the camel represents Islam. And also the donkey or the ass represents Islam. So that's what we are seeing here. So it is now saying that the appearance of these people, the appearance of them, is as the appearance of horses, and as a horseman, so shall they run. Verse 5. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains, shall they leap like the noise of the flame of fire and devour the stubble, as a strong people set in the battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall search uh, everyone on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. What does it mean when you fall on the sword and you're not wounded? We we'll realize that this is a tactic of Islam to do suicide bombing. In this case whereby if it is a suicide bombing, uh, you wound yourself, but you don't feel the wound. Why? Because you choose the wound. In other words, you do it uh, in a suicidal method, whereby they fall on the sword, and the sword does not wound them. It's what they are like also to understand from that verse. Verse 9 says that they shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb up upon the houses, they shall enter in at the windows like a thief, the earth shall quake before them, the heaven shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now, verse 10 has talked of the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. We need to know these symbols as well. Verse 11 says, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. So this is God's army. We note that. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great, and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Verse 13, And rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Now, I wanted to read all that to give us the, uh, the picture. When you read verse 11 to verse 13, it gives the duty that we are supposed to do when we see this day of the Lord coming. And in this day of the Lord, we see a great army being mentioned. We see gloominess, darkness, a day of clouds, and thick darkness. These things, we have to uh, move with them in the Bible to see all events that are connected to this. Then we can understand what is this day of the Lord. Amen. Okay, now, to understand more characteristics of this group, go to chapter 1. Go to chapter 1, and we are reading verse 5, verse 7. I hope you are with me, and you are following in your Bible. We are reading verse 5 to verse 7. It says that, Awake ye drunkards, and weep and hold all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Now listen, for a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number. What is an attribute of Islam that we knew? Coming from Arabia, is that they come in the form of locusts, they come in form of a swamp. Many. So this is what it means that a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a what? A teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Those characteristics are in Revelation as we're going to read them. 
verse 7. He hath laid my vine and waste, and bapt my fig tree, hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. What does this mean? What uh, thing do we know that when it goes in a place, it eats up all the green things? It's of course the locusts. They are the ones that do this. And this is the same thing that we see in Revelation. So this group, without doubt, means Islam. Go with me to Revelation 9, just quickly, the chapter that addresses Islam. <coughs> Revelation. We are reading verse um, verse 7. Verse 7 says, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses. Now these horses are the ones we have just read about in Joel. Prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as, as the teeth of what? Their teeth were as the teeth of lions. It's the same thing we have read in the book of Joel. So without doubt, here, these verses are talking about the same group. These are the locusts. This is, this is, this is uh, the horses. This is Islam. Clearly presented in the word of God. All right. So we have seen the day of gloominess and darkness, the great day of the Lord. We'd like to understand how important is that for us to know in our time. Go with me to Isaiah. We are opening the book of Isaiah, chapter 27. Isaiah 27, we are reading verse 8. Verse 8. Isaiah 27 verse 8 says that, In measure, when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. He stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind. By this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit to take away his sin. When he maketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones, that are beaten in sunder, the grooves and the images shall not stand up. Now, why am I reading this? Is that this issue of the wind, for those of you who have been with us previously, it is Islam that is connected with the wind. This is the wind that blows in the desert places and says that the camel sniffs the wind and in her time, you'll surely find her. I believe those of you who have been following us, you know the language. So in this issue, it says that in a measure when it shooteth forth, what does it mean? It means, what is this that is to come in measure? It is the rain. We realize that this is an issue of the early and the latter rain. We will collect the dots. Don't worry if you don't get it quickly. So in a measure when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. He stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind. So whatever this is, it is a wind that comes from the east. So it is an east wind. And this east wind comes at the same time when something comes in measure. And what is that that comes in measure? We realize uh, as we study more of the verses here, but we're not going to do that now that it is the early and the latter rain. Specifically the latter rain. When the latter rain comes in a measure, what will happen? They will be debating with the message. But in the same time, there will come an east wind. And what does the next verse, verse 9 say? That when this happens, we see the latter rain coming and we see the east wind coming. But then... What is the importance of that? What is God's will in, in that? It is that it is in verse 9. And verse 9 says that, By this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. Now, we know in the Bible that there is no other name on earth or heaven by which we are saved, but the name of Christ alone. 
So if it says that our sin is to be purged, the sin of Jacob, how do you connect this? Because who can purge our sin? Christ Jesus alone, by his Holy Spirit in us. But now the question would be, how do you connect that to the previous verse? It is referring to the issue that has been talked about as to come in a measure. This is the latter rain, and that is implying the Holy Spirit being given his people. So it is by that Holy Spirit being given his people that the sin of Jacob is purged. And, and let's continue reading that verse 9. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin. When he maketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in sander, the grooves and the images shall not stand. When you talk of the chalk stones and all these kind of things, what comes to our mind is the king called King Jos uh, Josiah in the time back. He's the one who did this work of beating up these stones into powder and removing them away from those altars, altars of God that were, that were turned into altars of worshipping small gods, of devil worship. In, the, in this case, it was a reformation effected by the Holy Spirit of God as they received the Holy Spirit. So it is the same thing being shown here. And this is an issue that is bringing in images. And what message in the Bible talks about idols or images? Of course, the second angel's message. Babylon is what? Is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of what? Of every evil spirit and all these kind of things. So now, the point is, these images that are being talked about here is something to do also with the second angel's message. Now, to make this clearer, go with me to Exodus. Please don't get tired. These studies, they need thinking. But I request that the, for those of you who have not been following, go on YouTube and you start from the beginning. Go with me to Exodus to make this clearer. <clears throat> we're opening chapter 10. We're looking at the, issue of, at the issue of the wind. We have seen the locusts in Revelation. We have seen the locusts also in Joel. But we want to see another issue concerning locusts and the wind in the book of Exodus. Chapter 10, verse 12 to verse 14. And this is what it has to say. It says that, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land. And all that the hail hath left. So what do the locusts do? They, ate, they eat every herb of the land or every green thing of the land. This is the same thing in the book of Joel that before them it is as Eden and behind them it is as a wilderness. In other words, this great army that looks as horses and looks like the locusts, Wherever they go before them, they spoil, they eat up every green thing, and behind them, they live a wilderness. So it's a characteristic we are seeing here also. Verse 13 says, And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind. What wind? An east wind. In Isaiah, we have read also something like east wind. So all these are connected. In your personal time, do personal study to see how these things link up. So Moses stretched his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. Again, when specifically did the locusts come? the morning. Do you see that? And when we read in Joel, it talked about the day of gloominess and darkness. You see? And the day of clouds. And it said that when the morning spreads on the what? On the mountains. Then the great army comes. And then we see the same characteristic here. When Moses stretches the rod, that day when it is stretched, the wind comes. 
that morning and that evening. But the lovers come specifically the next morning. Why morning? This is put repetitively in the Bible to help us understand in these cases. Amen. All right, let's continue to the next verse 14. And it says that, And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there were no such locusts as they. Neither after them shall be such. What did we read in Joel? It said that the great, the great army of God, never has there been such a great army. And it, there will not be any greater again for all other coming generations. And we see the attribute is the same when we are reading about these locusts. That gives us an, an understanding that these things have a connection. And this is all Islam. There's no doubt in this case. All right. So the, dark, the day of gloominess and thick darkness, that day is the day of the Lord. And that's when these events take place. What are those events? As we have read in Isaiah 27, there is an east wind. There is also what is given in measure. The next verse says that it is by this fruit, by this fruit that the sin of Jacob will be taken away. Question, what fruit is that? Of course, it is the fruit of righteousness that takes away the sin. But another question is, what brings about the fruit? It is what is given in measure, and that is the latter rain. That latter rain is given in measure, and that latter rain symbolizes the word of God, which is empowered by the Spirit of God, or the Holy Spirit. That is what gives us the spiritual fruits, the fruits of righteousness. But these events happen in the day of the Lord, in the day of gloominess and darkness and clouds, in the day when we see the locusts coming on the face of the earth, before them the garden, the places are the garden of Eden, and behind them after passing through that place, it is as a wilderness. In other words, they eat up every green thing. And these are likened to locusts, they are likened to horses, their teeth is as the teeth of the lions. And we see the same thing in Joel. It's in the same thing in the book of Revelation, chapter 9. And we conclude according to our previous studies that this is Islam. All right. Now, move with me to a very crucial chapter that we need as well to follow up. <clears throat> move with me. Now, before you... Let's go to Isaiah. Let's go back to Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27. Isaiah, we're reading verse um, 27. Let's read again. Let's read this time around verse 5 to verse 9. There's a picture I'd like you and me to receive. Verse 9 says this, Or let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. What does it mean? When you to take root, what gives you ability to take root? Is if the rain has come. If there's no rain, of course, it will die. The seed will die. You see? So the causing to take the root is the rain here. So, Let's continue. He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall what? Shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. What brings about that? What, what makes the plants to get roots into the soil and get fruits? Uh, basically, before even the fruits, what makes them to blossom and get buds and then make fruits? It is the rain. In this case, biblical sense, the early and the latter rain. I'm building up something uh, a little bit uh, new that I like us, we are going to make it clearer in the next study. The early and the latter rain. And why do we study the prophecy of this Islam, how it is connected in prophecy? It is to help us to understand in the time which God is doing this work. 
and when it will end, such that we may make, we may evaluate, you know, the, the opportunities that God gives us. Okay. It says that he shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root, and Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Read with me verse 7. Hath he smitten him as he, sm as he smote those that smote him? Or is he slain according to the slaughter of them that are slain by him? Verse 9. Then it says that in measure, when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. In other words, this message when it is being given, there has to be debate. Arguments against it. And this is what is happening today in present truth. Let's continue. He stirred his rough wind in the day of the east wind. <clears throat> now this wind is rough. And he stirs it. But I like you to see these, thing, these things here. There are two things here. He stirred his rough wind when? In the day of the east wind. Okay. Now question is, what is this rough wind that God is staying? What does it mean by staying? It is to restrain, to hold back. You see? It's very easy to see. Go with me to Revelation. Just note these points. Go with me to Revelation chapter 7. God stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind. You see? So, meaning, he stays it, and then after, he loses it. You see? Read with me chapter 7 of Revelation, verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding how many winds? Four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. What does that mean, to tell them to not lose the winds? It means he is staying the winds. He is restraining the winds. And what are these winds? These four winds, we realized that there are winds of strife. They mean wars, pestilences, famines, and so on. So they are winds of strife. So it can also, strife can still mean rough wind. So when we read in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 8, and it says that, he stirred his rough wind in the day of the east wind. He is trying to imply what you read in Revelation chapter 7. And that, that is in Revelation chapter 7, when that rough wind is being stayed, in what time is it being stayed, is the question. Read still verse 8 of chapter 27, Isaiah. It says that that rough wind is stayed in what? In the day of the east wind. So the question is, what is the east wind? When we, according to what we have read in Exodus, this east wind is, uh, has a function to bring the locusts. You see that? So whatever this east wind is, it brings about the locusts. The wind in the desert it blows the locusts and they come rushing in big numbers. You see, and that is the great army of horses that we are reading in Joel. So what we see is this east wind brings Islam in position of prophecy and it operates according to the jihad. So that means in the time when Islam is coming in, in terms of this jihad, the third war as we are studying right now, it is in that time that God stays his what? His rough wind. It is in that time that the prophecy of Revelation chapter 7 is taking place. You see that? That is why we have a conclusion that in 2001, when the east wind came in and the locusts came, Islam came to attack the Twin Towers, it is in this time, at 2001, that the Revelation chapter 7 was fulfilled whereby the angels that are on the four corners of the earth were told to hold the what? To hold the four winds. Why? They are being restrained. He stays the rough wind. He stays it. He stays it. He restrains it in this time of the east wind. So as Islam comes in, 
God restrains it. You see? And the four winds we know will be released at the National Sunday Law. But still they will be released progressively. So that means still in this time, it will be the time of the east wind. I don't know if you have got that point. Is what I wanted us to come for in chapter 27. Okay. Go with me to chapter 21. Very important chapter. Chapter 21 of Isaiah. Isaiah 21, we looked at this chapter last time. I'd like us to see it there again. Verse 10. Now, Isaiah chapter 21 is very uh, crucial. It brings up Islam in the picture very clearly. And what it does, it shows us this Islam in terms of the third war very clearly. And then also it shows us the end of Islam. <clears throat> at the general clause of probation. There's something very interesting that we can also see there. So read with me kindly from verse 1. I'm going to be a little quick. Isaiah chapter 21, we're reading from verse 1. The burden of the desert of the sea, as the wild winds in the south pass through, so it cometh from the desert from a terrible land. It comes from where? From a desert. The wilderness, Arabia, where Islam comes from. From the desert, a terrible land. Verse 2. A grievous vision is declared unto me, the treacherous dealer, dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Media, all the sighting thereof have I made to seize. Verse 3. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was brought down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. Verse 4. My heart panted. Fearfulness have frightened me. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Prepare what? The table. Watch in the watchtower. Eat. Drink. Arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. Every word we have read here means much. Do personal study. When we talk of a table, what does it mean? We know a table is basically a symbol of uh, eating a meal. You make a table so that you put their food and you eat. Or you sit on the, at the table and talk and discuss. But normally, the tables... We make them such that we sit and eat food from there. So it says that uh, prepare the table in verse 5. And while you're preparing your table to eat, what do you do? Watch. Watch in a watchtower. And what do you do while you're watching in a watchtower? You eat. You don't eat only, but you also drink. You see? What is this eating here? It is eating the bread of life. It is eating the word of God. It is eating the flesh of Jesus Christ. And this drinking is drinking the blood of Jesus Christ in this uh, particular thing. And while you're doing that is while you're watching. Watching for what? Prophecy, for the time, for the events. And you see a column there. Then it says, arise. What is this arising? It is arising from the ashes of sin, arising from the evil of the flesh. And this can be proven throughout the Bible. When you go and read chapter 60 of Isaiah, it will tell you, arise and shine. That refers to Christ, at the same time it refers to us, his people. Arise and shine for thy, and so on, as you go and read in that chapter. It's the arising that you sing here. Okay. Ye princes, when it says the princes, it means the children of God. And anoint the shield. The shield is clearly shown in the book of Ephesians. The shield, uh, the shield is the shield of faith. This faith we must be having on God. And it says anoint that shield. The anointing is, the, is by oil. And this oil is the Holy Spirit. You see, I've simply broken down for you this, but that can be shown 
in a deeper way to, in, of study. But go with me. I'd like to bring forth what I have come for exactly. But what I'd like you and me to understand is that these things we are talking about arise, eat, drink, they are happening and are being called for to be done in the time when whatever we are going to read here is happening. All right. Verse 6 says, For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go, set a watchman, let him declare what he sees. Verse 7, And he saw a what? A chariot with a couple of what? Of horsemen. These horsemen, we read them in Joel. A couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses, and a chariot of camels. And he hearkened diligently with much heed. So it is watching now. Verse 8 says, And he cried a what? A lion. Now we read last time that they have the teeth as of a lion. When we interpret what that means, it means it implies the strength. They have strength. And this is the same thing we are seeing here that he's saying a lion. He's saying, and he cried, a lion, my Lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in that daytime. And I am set in my word all night. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, what? Babylon is what? Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her God he hath broken unto the ground. All right, now, when you go back to Isaiah chapter 27, and you read verse 9, it talked something about images and grinding the stones into chalk stones into the ground. It's the same thing being talked about here, that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And the graven images have been broken down and to the ground. Verse 9 of chapter 27, Isaiah said that, By this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit to take away his sins, when he maketh all the stones of the outer as chalk stones that are beaten in sander, beaten in sander, the grooves and the images shall not stand up. They will fall onto the ground. The same thing here in verse, um, in verse 9. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, is fall, uh, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. It's very interesting. We are seeing the Bible is bringing the picture of Islam at the same time is bringing the picture of the second angel's message. It's very clear. When you go to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 8, it tells the second angel's message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And I saw another angel, the second angel, coming. And then he said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. You know, and it's become the habitation of the devils and so on and so on. And when we go to Revelation chapter 18, we see the same message again. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, in the whole Bible, the word Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Just the way it is. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Appears only three times. The first time is in Isaiah, what we have read. The second time is in Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. And the last time it is in Isaiah, uh, sorry, is in Revelation chapter 18. And uh, <clears throat> I think verse, is it verse 2? Let me see. Yes, verse 2 of Revelation chapter 18, which says that, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So, if those are the three times in which uh, this Babylon is fallen, is fallen appears in the Bible, do you think that Isaiah chapter 21 is a very unique thing that has nothing to do with Revelation 14 and 18? Of course not. That is showing the same events to be taking place in that time period. And in this case, we are seeing Islam. Very clear. Verse 10 of, Revelation, of Isaiah chapter 21. As uh, our time, as we will be coming to the close for today. We're having just a little to, to ramp up. Okay, verse 9, verse 10 says that, On my threshing and the corn of my flow, that which I have heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you, 
The burden of who? We started last time, the sons of Ishmael. There are 12 sons having 12 tribes. You see? And among those sons, they have different names. We have Keda, Duma, and so on. And so this is the one of the names we realize here. This is the son of Ishmael. This is Islam in this case. Verse 11 says that, The burden of Duma, he calleth to me out of Seir, Seir. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The question is asked twice. We saw that this doubling of words implies the second year's message. Babylon is falling, is falling. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? And other places in the Bible, even when Christ is speaking, sometimes he says, verily, verily, I say unto you. Sometimes he says, verily, I say unto you. Why is that doubling? Other places you'll find a ho-ho, uh, you know, words of that similar kind. And when you study them and collect the dots, they mean the second angel's message. All right. So I said, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? Verse 12 is the answer. The watchman said, the morning cometh. He has not begun by night. The other one was asking, what of the night? What of the night? So the focus is the night. But the answer tries to bring into place that no, it's not just all about the night, but also the morning. Verse 12 I said, the watchman said, the morning cometh and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. Those words have a reason why they are like that. And we have to study to understand them. So, watchman, what of the night? And the answer comes that... That what? That, <clears throat> that the morning coming. This is morning. This morning began in 2001. But after the morning, when the National Sunday Law comes, which is at the close of probation as you're coming, as you're going ahead, it is the night. I already talked about this before. But I'm repeating for the sake of those who have not been with us. So this is the morning that began in 2001. But we have the night that is coming. The night is coming. That's why the focus is on the night because it's a big issue where we are going from. It is coming soon. But the watchman tries to bring to our understanding that there's also a morning that begins in 2001. That morning ends at the National Sunday Law when probation closes. And from the National Sunday Law, the night begins. What does it mean? Islam has something to do in the morning, but there is also a role it will play in the night. So we expect Islam to do something as well in the night, just at the close of probation. That's very important to mark. Verse 13 says that, the burden upon Arabia. As you see that? This is the same issue we are saying, Arabia. Verse 13 has said, The burden upon Arabia. In the forest in Arabia shall ye lodge, all ye traveling companies of Dedanim. Verse 14. The inhabitants of the land of Tema brought water to him that was thirsty. They prevented with their bread him that fled. This is showing the end of Islam. Of Islam. For they fled from the swords from the brown sword, and from the bent bow, and from the grievousness of war. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Within a year, according to the years of an hireling, and all the glory of Kedah shall fail. Kedah is one of the sons of Ishmael. So this is Islam. Verse 17 says, And the residue of the number of the Akhas, and the mighty men of the children of Kedah, shall be diminished, for the Lord God of Israel hath spoken it. So there is a group, of the Islam that will be diminished, but there's also a group that will be saved. We shall get that clearer next time as we make other points, uh, other important points shown up. All right, now, interestingly enough, uh, we are, let's read these verses as well, and uh, we are ending with some quotes. We're having one, I uh, think, three verses to read. Okay, go with me to Ezekiel. This is the day of the Lord, the morning. Go with me to Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel, as we come to our close soon. We are reading Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7, we are beginning from verse 1. Now, please follow me carefully on your side. It says that, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Also thou, son of man, that saith the Lord God, unto the land of Israel, and end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Where else in the Bible do we read the four corners of the land? And when it says the land, it means earth. Where else do we read about the four corners of the earth? Revelation chapter 7. Interesting. The end is come <clears throat> and says it two times. An end. One time, the end is come upon the four corners of the earth, of the land. Second time. Verse 3. Now is the end come upon thee, and I will send mine anger upon thee, and will judge thee according to, the, to thy ways, and will recompense upon thee. All thine abominations, and mine eye shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abomination shall be in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Thus is the Lord God, and evil, and only evil, behold, is come. And the end is come. The end is come. Do you see that doubling, brothers? Verse 6. An end is come, the end is come. It watches for thee, behold, it is come. The morning is come upon a come unto thee. Which morning? Which morning? The morning we have been talking about. And it is this morning. The morning is come unto thee. O thou that dwellest in the land, the time is come, the day of trouble is near. Now when the morning comes, the day of trouble is what? Is near. And what is that trouble? It is Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. The day of trouble, Jacob's trouble. So when the morning comes, the day of trouble is very near. Is what he's trying to show. The morning is come unto thee, O thou that dwellest in the land. The time is come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. Now will I shortly pour out my fury upon thee and accomplish mine anger upon thee, and I will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense thee for all thine abomination. And mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. I will recompense thee according to thy ways and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. Behold the day, behold it is come, the morning is gone forth. Why is God repeating the morning issue? It is this morning. It is the morning that is in Joel. It is the morning that is in Isaiah chapter 21. He asked him, watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The answer came, the morning cometh, and the night cometh. And this morning, according to Joel, it is a day of gloominess, darkness, and clouds. And it is also called the great day of the Lord. So what is that great day of the Lord? We need to understand it. Now we realize that very clearly, if that morning with clouds and gloominess is beginning in 2001 here, according to our conclusions, when we collect all the dots, then the day of the Lord or the great day of the Lord, when does it begin? Of course in the morning. It begins 2001. The great day of the Lord. And when does it end? It ends when Christ comes back the second time. So the great day of the Lord is not one day. It is a period of time. But in that period of time, God uses the symbol of Islam to be the great operating army in that time period. So why? that's why it's important for us to study Islam in this case. Not all about being informed about Islam and so on, but... To understand that it is in that time that the sin of Jacob, according to Isaiah chapter 27, has to be taken away. The time when Jacob has to bring forth the fruits. The time in which Jacob's sin has to be purged. The time in which we are to eat and drink. And while we are eating and drinking the word of God, we are watching on a watchtower 
watching what is coming. And what is coming? The lion, my lord, a chariot of houses, you see, and they come to do what? To destroy before them is as it is Eden, and when they pass through, it remains as a wilderness. I hope you are getting the point. Let's continue. Verse nine, uh, verse ten has said, "Behold the day, behold it is come. The morning is gone forth. The rod hath blossomed. Pride hath budded." This blossoming and uh, the and uh, uh, and budding, we saw it in Isaiah chapter twenty-seven. You see. Now this time round, it is pride. And what? It is pride, and uh, it is pride that has budded and has blossomed. But then we need to understand that while iniquity is increasing, it is in that same time that God's righteousness is increasing in His people. You see, verse eleven says, "Violence is risen up into a road of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor of their mouth you know of any of theirs. Neither shall there be wailing for them." Amen. Uh, we should be finishing in just uh, in a little time, just a few minutes. We can be remaining with around around ten minutes. Okay, so that's the morning that is again shown here. It is an evil day. It's a, it is a, a day of gloominess and darkness. Amen. Amen. Okay, now I would like us to go to our PowerPoint. Let's read this. We are reading this from prophets, uh, patriarchs and prophets. Patriarchs and prophets. Now listen to this. Next time we shall make this thing more crystal clear and very uh, uh, interesting because for now you may not get the whole picture. But the point is, whatever happened at Mount Sinai, brothers, it was implying a repeat of history that will always happen. At Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments were given, but this was typifying the Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given. The same thing typifies today when God is giving his Holy Spirit in the symbol of the early and the latter rain. So listen, we have been reading about the great day of the Lord, the great of, the day of gloominess and so on, and it is the same we are seeing right here. Okay, now read with me. It says that never since man was created had there been witnessed such a manifestation of divine power as when the law was proclaimed from Sinai. So considering the flood, considering the creation of the world and all these things, all those things, there was never such a great manifestation of the power of God in all those things compared to how it was manifested on what? Mountain Sinai. Notice that. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped, and the presence of God, even Sinai itself, was moved at the presence of God. Very interesting. Why? Out of all the experiences of God's people and how God has led us, why out of all of them was this issue of Mount Sinai the greatest among all? It is because he was giving a great thing. His character at the same time was making himself known. You'll understand that when we say making himself known, it is what happens in the time of this great day of the Lord. Okay. All right. You may not read this, but in your free time, read it. Read Deuteronomy chapter 4. You go and read what happens on this day that Ellen White is saying that never since man was created was there manifestation of great power as that was, that was shown on Mount Sinai. Question is why? Go and read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1 to verse 31, if you can. And we will we'll realize that that is the great day of the Lord. But then, let's connect it with Joel. Go with me to Joel chapter 2 as we close. Go with me to Joel chapter 2. We are reading verse 2. Joel chapter 2 verse 2 speaks of a day. Read this. It says that a day of darkness 
and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even the years of many generations. Was it a day of darkness on Mount Sinai? Yes, there was good darkness that the Lord brought to cover him such that his glory, his brightness does not destroy those people. There were clouds there also. There were clouds there. You see, there was darkness. And when you read this issue of clouds, it is very nicely shown in the Bible when uh, David is talking about this scenario. And go with me there. This scenario, when David is talking about these commandments being given about Sinai, there's a way he addresses it. Go with me to Psalms chapter 68. This is our second last verse to read. Uh, third last, as we are going to be reading <clears throat> some few quotes, as, which, is the, which are the last. All right. Psalms. Psalm 68. Read with me verse 7 to verse Nine. What does it say? Psalm 68, verse 7 to verse 9 says, O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness. When is this? In the time of the Israelites through the wilderness. Verse 8 says, The earth did what? The earth shook. The heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Read with me verse 9. Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain. So Psalms is talking about plentiful rain. But when we read it in Deuteronomy, do we see anything like rain? No, we see the clouds. So the clouds on the other side was simplifying, showing what David is talking about, plentiful rain. You see? Plentiful rain. Verse uh, 9 says that, verse 9 says that, Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. You see? It is a plentiful rain that God gave at Mount Sinai when he was giving the Ten Commandments. What is that? It is the early and the latter rain. The early and the latter rain. We'll understand that. All right. Go with me to Zephaniah. Now, you may need to read this on your own time. Go with me to Zephaniah chapter 1. Let's try it if possible. Let's try it. Zephaniah chapter 1. This is our second last verse. Zephaniah is in uh, <clears throat> the old, in the last books. The last books of the Old Testament, Zephaniah, is after Habakkuk. We are reading chapter 1. We are not going to finish all the verses. Read verse 4 with me. Verse 4 says, I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah and upon the inhabitants of the Jerusalem, and I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the name of the Chemarims with the priests, and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear by and swear by the name by the Lord, and that swear by Malcham. All right, continue down. Verse eight, and it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold, which fill their master's house with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be the noise of a cry from the fish gate, and an howling from the second, and a great crashing from the hills. Now continue reading down. Verse 14 says that the great day of the Lord is what? Is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. We are talking about the same day in this case. Okay. We are reading the last verse in from Proverbs. 
Read with me Proverbs. So when God is giving this plentiful rain, he makes himself known. And that is the Holy Spirit. That's the early and the latter rain. He is giving his Holy Spirit. Read with me Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 22. Two verses in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22 and verse 23. Okay, and this is what it says. 22 says that how long ye simple ones will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make myself, make known my words unto you. So what God did on Mount Sinai, he made his words known unto them. He gave plentiful rain. This is what happened. Okay. Now, this is our last quotation. And I'd like you and I <clears throat> to read it together. Sorry. We are reading this from pamphlets. Uh, we'll skip that. We'll read this one. We're reading this from pamphlet 1. 57. And this is what it says. The third angel flying in the midst of heaven and heralding the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. This is what was given on Mount Sinai, brothers and sisters. So the third angel that goes with these things, what does he represent? Represents our work. The message loses none of its force in the angel's onward flight. For John sees it increasing in strength and power until the whole earth is lightened with its glory. Revelation chapter 18. The cause of God's commandments keeping people is onward, ever onward. The message of truth that we bear must go to nations, tongues, and people. Soon it will go with a loud voice, and the earth will blatten with its glory. Are we preparing for this great outpouring of the Spirit of God? In other words, are we preparing for the plentiful rain? Just what God did on Mount Sinai is what we should ask ourselves. Amen. So you can pause on YouTube and read these quotes in your free time. And uh, that is the end of our study today. So brothers, are we preparing for the plateful rain in the great day of the Lord? Next time, we'll be handling the third part. You see, the third war is huge. We'll be handling the third part of the third war. Please come with your friends and we study together. May the Lord bless you. Let us pray. Holy Father, forgive us of our unrighteousness. In such a time as you're giving the plateful rain, it may be falling on hearts all around us, but we are not receiving that it. Save us, Lord, that we may not be the victims of not receiving the Holy Spirit. But I pray, Lord, that you may give us the early and the latter rain. Fit us for the latter rain, Lord, even the, in the, even the early rain. For those that have studied, those that have not, help those that have not to come and study when this video is uploaded. Please us from all sin. Bless us this Sabbath, dear Lord. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.